now. So uh, welcome everyone and welcome Peter, uh, the first speaker. Um, we can start, your slides are here. So uh, so you can introduce yourself and, uh, and uh, what, what do you do? Okay, we can start. Okay, oops, I went too fast. Okay, so good evening to uh, everyone. I'm um, very glad to be here, very glad to see so many participants. Uh, I count 167 at the moment, so it's uh, great news. So um, thank you very much for being here. I also see that there is a big variety of uh, people coming from all over Europe and also outside of Europe, so uh, really, really pleased uh, with that. Uh, I'm Peter Birch. I am an uh, education policy analyst at um, uh, UREDC, um, and I'm also uh, one of the authors of this report, Digital Education at School in Europe, which is about two months ago. Um, just uh, before I get into my second slide, just if we can run a very quick uh, poll here, maybe you can use the um, the icon on the left, top left hand side and um, say uh, disagree if you don't know what UREDC is and agree if you know what it is. We do this quickly. It's great, it's going well. Okay. Right, so okay, I think that there are a majority of people that actually know what UREDC is. Still, there are quite a few people that don't. So I'm gonna just say a few words about UREDC very quickly, um, so that then we can uh, get into the more the content of the the report. Thank you for for uh, voting there. Um, right, so UREDC is, is um, a network um, made of ministries mainly of, uh, of education. Um, in, it includes uh, clearly all the member states, but also a number of other countries which uh, gravitate around uh, Europe and are uh, participating also to other actions of the Erasmus Plus uh, program like uh, Turkey, uh, Serbia, uh, Norway, uh, Iceland, I saw Iceland as well here. So um, we actually um, from uh, Brussels in the in this central um, uh, unit uh, where I work, we coordinate the work of this network. We collect the data from our national units, and you can see in this slide the all the all the units that uh, participate in the in the in the network. Um, we collect the data and we then um, write comparative reports according to uh, specific themes like the one I'm just about to present on digital education. But we also deal with uh, teachers, uh, for example, uh, teacher salaries. We update uh, um, uh, this information every, uh, every year, or um, student fees and support measures in higher education. Uh, we also uh, publish on our website information on uh, the um, on the uh, education systems in each country, um, and and there you would find on our website information that is more uh, descriptive of each system rather than being comparative, like uh, in the reports uh, that we uh, compile and we uh, and we write. These reports are usually intended mainly for policymakers uh, in order to uh, take uh, informed decisions when it comes to uh, reforms, improving the, 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 the system as a whole. Um, I think that gives a, a very uh, quick um, overview of what UREDC is. We, we work mainly with our um, Directorate General Education and Culture here at uh, the Commission. Um, 
and um, and we do uh, we we compile reports according to uh, European priorities and national priorities. Okay, having said that, let me get now uh, straight into the uh, report: uh, digital education at school in Europe. Um, just to, to set a bit uh, the, the, the scene, the scope of the report is on school education and we deal with primary and general secondary uh, levels. Um, so we don't deal with uh, vocational education, something that is quite important when it comes to digital education. But uh, there is another uh, network which is CEDEFOP at European level that uh, deals directly with uh, vocational education and training. The reference year for the, 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 the report and the data that we present is the school year 2018-19. So there might be things that are um, already have already changed or are already changing in the course of this new um, academic year. We cover 43 education systems in this report, the 28 uh, member states, but also uh, the other countries are like uh, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Switzerland, Iceland, and you can see the list on the slide. Um, our main source of information and data is regulations and legislations and official guidance by top level education authorities. That means that we really look at the law, the policies that are in place that are uh, affect the whole education system. We're look at, looking at the structural uh, aspects rather than the practice in the classroom. So we don't really deal with um, maybe pedagogical approaches or uh, what happens really in the classroom between the teacher uh, and the, the, the students, the pupils, uh, but rather at how policymakers are uh, legislating around specific areas. Um, the report itself on digital education deals with uh, two aspects, um, digital competences and the pedagogical use of uh, technology. So when we say digital education, we intend uh, the, two, the two aspects of it. It's not just about using uh, digital devices uh, or having uh, number of competences that we'll see a bit uh, later uh, more in detail but also how actually um, technology is used for learning um, and uh, another uh, aspect that uh, it's important to take into account is that we use as a main definition of digital uh, competences the um, 2018 key competence definition um, that was agreed by the uh, the member states uh, which says digital competence involves confident, critical and responsible use of an engagement with the full range of digital technologies for learning at work and for particip participation in uh, society. So uh, there are a number of aspects that are in this definition. Uh, that we try to then take and uh, operate uh, to, to make it uh, operational within the report. The four aspects, main aspects that we looked at um, and that are organized uh, in, in four uh, chapters is curriculum, uh, teacher training and support, assessment and strategies and policies. And I will uh, say a few words about each uh, chapter, making some examples of the uh, indicators that we used. Um, there is a, in the report also, there are actually five uh, annexes, which are uh, actually full of information, uh, really useful. And I invite you to go and have a look. We have, for example, Annex 5, where you will have a list and links to all the um, agencies and bodies across Europe that provide support to teachers um, uh, on digital education, support to schools, but also sometimes support to policymakers. Um, so in a number of areas like, for example, providing digital learning resources. Um, and of course, you can look at the ones from your country if you don't know which one it is, but you can also look at ones from other countries that might interest you. But there are also uh, other annexes which are very interesting, which, 
for example, for teachers, the teacher competence frameworks that we've taken into account, which describe the digital competences for teachers, or the, um, uh, the, the reforms that are ongoing at the moment in the countries, the curricular approaches, uh, etc. Uh, maybe it's better if you just have a look and, um, and then if you have any questions, you can come back to us. Um, let me now get into the, um, uh, into the chapters and I'll start with the first one on curriculum. Um, we've looked at a number of areas um, and I think that the main aspects that I want to uh, discuss here with you is the cu different curricular approaches that uh, we have uh, in Europe for um, I think one specific, I'll just concentrate on lower secondary education as an example in uh, today's presentation. Uh, we also looked at uh, ongoing curricular reforms uh, related to digital competences and then some of the competence areas and learning outcomes that, uh, um, that are covered uh, in the curriculum. Um, so as far as the first aspect, what I can say is that in general across Europe there are very uh, different approaches. I mean, digital uh, uh, competences can be um, approached in the curriculum as a cross-curricular uh, theme uh, and therefore let's say each um, teacher and within each subject it should be um, it should be um, let's say uh, developed as a as a competence a compulsory separate subject it means that actually is uh, digital competences are included in some other uh, subject, specific subject this time, it could be math, it could be science, it could be uh, technology itself, uh, where, um, uh, where digital competences are uh, developed. In other cases, it is integrated into other compulsory uh, subjects, and then in a few cases also all three uh, approaches. Um, at, at the level of uh, lower secondary education, you can see that most, the vast majority of countries develop digital competences in some, some way and there are a couple of education systems, Scotland and uh, the Netherlands, where there is a certain autonomy of uh, schools in deciding which approach they want to take for, um, uh, uh, for uh, digital competences. Just to make a a uh, concrete example, if I take a few countries I've listed here in this slide, um, I think the format of the slides change when they're uploaded, but it uh, doesn't matter. I think they're still visible. So in Hungary, for example, you would have um, digital competence as a cross-curricular theme uh, across um, different education levels, so from uh, primary education to upper secondary education but also it's a compulsory separate subject at lower and upper secondary uh, education uh, called computer science. In uh, Romania, you would have an approach which is an optional separate subject at primary level with technology of information, and it then becomes a compulsory uh, separate subject at um, uh, lower and secondary education. And so you will find this information more in the report for each country, um, and, um, and 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 there you would have all all the countries for all the education le uh, levels listed, and you can find exactly the differences between your own country and other countries. Um, another aspect that I wanted to um, to highlight is um, some of the learning outcomes that are covered in the different. Um, curriculum and of course we could not map all of them uh, there are many uh, so we looked at some of them and in this graph you can see that still some uh, are more developed than others and also at different education levels you can have more or less coverage uh, if you if you look at uh, coding for example is uh, not uh, uh, that is developed more at, uh, at lower and upper secondary education compared to primary education. Um, 
but then if you look at, for example, uh, protecting uh, one's own health, this is something that is less developed at upper secondary education compared or less covered, let's say, by the curriculum um, compared to lower secondary education or primary. So generally, I think that there are some areas that are clearly under uh, covered in the curriculums, like, for example, digital identity, which would contain aspects like, like protecting one's own digital identity, uh, cover, um, creating digital identity. Um, and this is um, really underdeveloped across, uh, across Europe. You can see that uh, it's about uh, 10 to 15 uh, education systems that would actually cover this out of the 43 that uh, we've been um, analyzing. So there's still scope for uh, improving uh, some aspects um, uh, in terms of, um, of, the, of, the, of the learning outcomes that are covered in the curriculum. Um, moving on, uh, always on, uh, on the curriculum part, it's also to say that uh, there are uh, more than well, there are 50% of the education systems that are currently reforming their curriculum related to digital competences, and this can go in different directions. It's either addressing it for the first time because it wasn't previously addressed. Uh, maybe it was addressed at a certain education level, but not at others. Um, uh, in some cases, trying to introduce it earlier, uh, as from primary education or strengthening uh, its present, introducing new uh, curriculum approaches and or uh, subjects. Um, moving on to the second chapter on teachers, uh, we looked at uh, mainly uh, two aspects, um, how teachers are uh, formed, in, especially in the area of initial teacher education. And then we've looked at some of the support measures like uh, continuing professional development, um, teacher networks, and self-assessment tools. Uh, here I'm just going to concentrate on the first part. Um, there are also plenty of tools in uh, professional development, uh, in the professional development area uh, at European level. I think that we are going to have a presentation on selfie. But there is also, well, the whole e-twinning experience uh, that is um, uh, very much linked to uh, digital competences for teachers, and there are a number of other uh, support measures at the uh, European level. So how are teachers uh, trained and formed uh, in terms of digital competences? Um, the first slide here uh, shows, first of all, if uh, digital competences are part of the teacher competence frameworks. Now, the teacher competence frameworks are um, a description of what a teacher should know, should be able to do in the classroom, uh, or in general on its own uh, job. So uh, should the teacher um, be interacting with parents, or uh, how, 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 what they should know in terms of, uh, of um, and be able to do in terms of um, managing behavior of, uh, of, of students. I'm just making there some, some examples. So digital competences should be part of these uh, teacher uh, competence frameworks. And we can see that in, the, in a number of countries, actually, the digital competences are part of a specific competence framework. So there is a specific competence framework, which sometimes um, is inspired by the European digital competence framework. Um, and those uh, digital competence framework actually go into a level of detail which is really interesting. They really describe the competences with, uh, with some uh, precision and they go a bit more in depth compared to more general teacher competence framework. But it's also to say that in many cases, although they might be specific as a digital competence framework, they're optional when it comes to um, um, initial teacher education. So higher education uh, institution or in general initial teacher education providers are not obliged to use them as, um, uh, let's say, uh, inspiration for developing their own uh, uh, programs. Um, so there are these uh, specific digital competence framework. They're very much more detailed than the others, but not always 
uh, used when it comes to initial teacher education. Um, the second slide I want to show you is that, in fact, um, is when teacher uh, digital competences have to be uh, developed. Uh, well, not other, rather than when, if they have to be developed during an initial teacher education. I mean, you can see here uh, the, the colors are not there, so it's difficult. This is because the, um, the, uh, the format of the um, slides have changed when uploading. So I'm just now opening my local presentation to show, well, not to show, I can't show it, but at least I can read the legend. Sorry for this. Um, So you've seen in uh, in pink those that um, the um, uh, digital competence have to be developed during initial teacher education. Um, in in blue when they should be developed during teacher initial education, and in white where there is no obligation at all. Um, you also see that the black spot, the black uh, dots. Um, indicates that when uh, digital competences have to be assessed in the context of initial teacher education and the white ones where uh, they have to be assessed after initial teacher education, for example, during the period of uh, induction, for example, or just before getting the, 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 the final um, uh, contract as a, as a teacher. So different approaches uh, in Europe also for what is uh, the development of teacher competence, uh, teacher uh, digital competences. Uh, coming to assessment, we have analyzed also here different aspects, and I'm going to concentrate on two aspects. One is the existence of a national test for the assessment of digital competences and the use of digital technologies in national tests. Um, so in terms of the first one, um, I can say that um, there are um, a number of countries that are actually assessing digital competences in national tests. They do this in different, um, for different reasons. Uh, one of them could be that they do that as part of the quality assurance uh, of education systems. So there, these tests do not have actually an impact on uh, the pupil's uh, schooling career, but it's rather to, to, uh, to, to check if um, there is, um, the, the education system is able to uh, deliver um, on, on digital education. Um, there is also a tests that uh, take place to, to actually test the competence of individual pupils, and this can have an impact on their uh, schooling career. Um, this happens mainly at upper secondary education compared to lower secondary education. You can see in the slide that only two countries do some kind of national test or have in place some kind of national test mechanism for uh, primary students. So it's mainly at upper secondary education that uh, countries uh, have national tests for digital competences. But in most cases, it is to be said that this is for um uh for assessing for uh, um uh, assessing a smaller uh, number of pupils compared to lower secondary education usually at lower secondary education all pupils are assessed while at upper secondary education only pupils that have taken a specific uh, learning path for example math or or sciences um, or that want to take uh, tests in uh, digital competence because they need it for their higher education enrollment would be tested. So the, the, the number of pupils tested at upper secondary education is, uh, is, is, is selected compared to uh, lower secondary education. The other aspect that we looked at is the use of, national, of uh, digital technologies for national tests. So um, here uh, we can see that actually there are quite a few countries that do use um, digital technologies 
at upper secondary education. This is related only to upper secondary education. So uh, let's say, for example, at the end of the um, of the of of, of uh, upper secondary school. Um, so the, really, the the national test that so then uh, allows you to uh, to go to um, uh, to university, uh, for example. So. Um, but here you can see that, uh, well, you can't see, but, it, but what needs to be said is that in many cases, digital technologies are used only to test digital competences. And there are still a few countries where digital competences are still tests in national tests, but uh, digital technologies are not used. Um, but apart from that, there is, it is also um, worth saying that uh, some countries like, for example, Finland uh, or in Denmark uh, at lower secondary education this time though, but um, to, to, to stick to Finland, for example, the matriculation exam, which is really after uh, you finished uh, upper secondary school, um, is um, really now taking place uh, through digital technology and it's being rolled out throughout the country. So the type of competences that are assessed go beyond the digital competence and that's really a big uh, game changer also in terms of how to think of the whole uh, test and assessments uh, we haven't yet evaluated um, the, the, the the content itself of the test so hopefully this will be we will be able to do it in the in the future but of course using the technology is going to change the way you actually approach what you're going to test and uh, how you're going to test it. Um, I think I need to uh, wrap it up now with the last few slides. We looked at more general strategies and policies on uh, digital education. And, um, and here I'm just going to, um, to give you a uh, very brief overview. We looked at the existence of external agencies that support teachers, uh, and I said uh, something about that at the beginning. So you do also find an annex in our report, and you can find the the name and uh, and the website of these uh, agencies. Um, we looked at uh, the existence of teacher network, and you can find further information uh, in the report as as well. And we also know that uh, in many cases. Um, only 16 um, in all, only 16 education system have uh, compulsory training for school heads in uh, digital education. I think that's a, a, an important finding in terms of policy development for the future. And also, we know that in 22 education system, there is the possibility of uh, having a school digital coordinator. Um, so there is also there some margin of improvement if we want to, um, let's say, reinforce the um, leadership aspect, uh, because teachers, of course, can have the digital competences and can uh, can can uh, uh, try to to change things. But if there isn't that uh, leadership uh, within the school, everything becomes more uh, difficult. Right, that was a bit of a rush, I must say. Um, it's um, it's um, it's quite a um, uh, big report with lots of information, lots of maps, and uh, I invite you uh, to read um, read it. And if you don't have time to go through the whole report, maybe you want to have a look at the brief, um, which you also find on our website. Uh, more information. Um, is on our website on this aspect and other aspects. Uh, you can, of course, uh, download all the information from uh, UDC, all the reports. Okay, free, yes, thanks, uh, uh, thanks Peter. A lot. Very interesting us. presentation. Um, that's uh, there's just a now, question Can we open an account on this platform? But um, uh, is there any login for this uh, uh, Eurodice? Round of questions, if I'm not mistaken. In. You just need to go to the website. It's an open website. Yes, exactly. Thanks a lot. So now we're Not going to UDC, um, jump into the next presentation uh, where we can take some more questions afterwards. So next we have Sean Gallagher. Um, he will be talking a bit I more said, about um, 
selfie tool and uh, some um, examples from their school level. So Sean, I hope you can hear us. I can put for the um, camera here as well. And of course we can share you the slides afterwards. So if you miss something and yeah, for the you, you'll see the right colors and everything. So there you go. Um, okay, there's a bit of a problem with the video you had inserted, so it's not uh, available, but uh, we can move on to the next one. Oh, Sean, can you hear us? Could you um, plug in okay, your Okay, can everyone hear me now? now? So far, we cannot hear you. Okay, I'll try the camera, but I will warn you that my profile picture is younger yes, uh, you. than uh, I am in reality. So, uh, so uh, I think my camera is working. I can see myself. I know, it's, it's okay. It's all fine. We can put that. Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, you need uh, to click one green. more time to start sharing, so then we will be able to, yeah, so it's two click process. Greetings from the west coast of Ireland, um, and I'm honoured to be asked to speak to you all today. Uh, I think it's fantastic that we have 220 people online now, and the potential of the multiplier effect of our discussion is immense. So imagine we have 220 people thinking about the use of digital technologies in teaching, learning, and assessment. Uh, I'm using the digital competence um, definition um, that Peter already alluded to, that it's the confident, critical, and responsible use of and engagement with digital technologies for learning, work, and participation in society. And really, for the next few minutes, I'm going to concentrate on uh, this in the context of learning. Um, the critical question for teachers, really, and the critical question for me, is the use of technology of added value to my teaching and to my students' learning experience. And if the answer to that ever is no, well, then it's a waste of time. But I have yet to encounter a situation where that is the case. Um, what is my role as a teacher? Well, I'd like to think that I'm a reflective practitioner, that I construct learning opportunities for my students based on their prior experience. And I try to create as many opportunities for them as possible to assist discovery. And at all times, I have to be open to the idea of ongoing assessment. For my students, I want them to be active learners. I want them to be able to find, select, and manage information, to create content, to communicate and collaborate. I want them to be safe. I want them to be able to solve problems, that they're not just consuming information, but rather they're applying that information to new situations. And of course, I want them to reflect on their learning too. But as I progress through my almost 30-year career in teaching, I have become more and more aware of the online environment. So my role as a teacher as a reflective practitioner has not changed that much. However, the act of learning is now becoming more and more influenced by the online environment. So now my students have to find, select, and manage information online as well. And there are different sets of skills for finding, selecting, and managing information online than there are in the more traditional paper-based environment. The same applies to content creation. In the early stages of my career, students presented their learning mainly through paper, but now there are endless opportunities to show evidence of learning through video, through sound, etc. The same with communication and collaboration. We have 
the, the classroom can now extend to many different parts of Ireland, to many different parts of Europe, indeed to many different parts of the world. We can open up communication and collaboration into a global space. But that brings new roles, responsibilities, it brings new threats. And online safety is of huge and critical importance. Also, we want students to be able to work in this environment and the ability to think in the same way as computers are programmed places the, a whole new dimension of problem solving and certainly computational thinking is of huge importance. So that's kind of a, a summary of the context in which we're working. So when it comes to the selfie tool, one of the interesting slides that the selfie team use is this one, that we have 71 million students attending schools in Europe. And they're looking to policymakers and teachers like ourselves to support their skills in the digital society and workplace. We have 5.7 million teachers. As I said, 220 of us are having a conversation this evening about this and 250,000 schools in Europe, we're preparing our students for life and work in a digital age. The two reports that I uh, mentioned, and first of all, I'd take this opportunity to congratulate Peter and his team on a fantastic Eurodice report. And I'm not going to go into that in any detail. And I'll also mention the second report here on the second survey of schools ICT and education report. The whole context for what we're working has been scoped out magnificently in the introduction to the Euro DC report. And this is the standout statement for me, that the quality of pedagogy is the single in-school factor that has the greatest impact on students' learning outcome, the quality of the teaching. So therefore, the development of teachers' digital competence is a critical component if investment in digital technologies is to be maximized. So as a profession, if our digital competences are advanced, there is a far better chance that the students' learning outcomes in this whole domain will be enhanced as well. The next report, uh, I'm just going to focus on some of the findings from it, and you can download it. Um, I'll send the link in the slides. Um, some of the key findings relating to teachers' digital competence. That teachers are most confident in their own competence in the areas of safety, communication and collaboration, as well as information and data literacy, meaning they're least confident in digital content creation and problem solving. So therefore, it should come as no surprise that students seem to be most confident in the areas that the teachers are most confident in and least confident in the two areas that the teachers are least confident in. And I, I, I think that shows that really the two areas um, for development come in the area of digital content creation and problem solving. And the same thing when it applies to the opposite effect is teachers seem to be most confident working with basic uh, text files and not so much on programming, but students are the opposite. And I suppose that is perhaps the environment in which students and teachers have been introduced to digital technologies in. Moving on to the work that I have undertaken um, uh, here in Ireland uh, in a primary school. The context for the work was shaped by the digital strategy for schools. And a lot of the parents were requesting, is there any foundation work you can do in the area of programming and coding? Because our students, our children hope to do um, 
um, an in-depth study of ICT when they go to the next school level. So that was one influence. The next influence was advances and reports at EU level on digital competences. The digital competence framework for citizens, for schools, and for teachers. And really the one framework that we liked as a school team was the digital competence framework for teachers because it wasn't all about technology and infrastructure. In Ireland, we also have looking at our school 2016. So the schools inspectorate ask us to consider schools under this framework. And in 2017, they produced a digital learning framework, which is built on the first learning framework. So all of this was happening in the last two years. And at the tool that we found extremely helpful was the selfie tool and it's a free online tool available in 31 languages and the link to sign up is there so i'm just going to guide you through an overview of this and the path or the journey that it took us on um, as i said it was built on the same three frameworks that we had looked at already the framework for citizens for educators and for schools. Since Selfie has been, uh, its origins have ha have, has been in the participation, not just of teachers and school leaders, but also of students. And that's the one thing that we were particularly impressed with. So it's been co-designed with students, teachers, school leaders, and the selfie process, in a nutshell, is this one. You register for the tool, and there is a school coordinator. You adapt the, school to your, the tool to your school's needs. So what you can do is you can take the bank of questions that are there for school leaders, for teachers, and for students. You can include optional questions and you can include some of your own questions. Once that is done, you send a URL to the school leaders, to the teachers, and to the students. You collect their views and their experiences. When all the results are in, you discuss the results and you plan for improvement. And like any good action plan, you monitor the progress and you change your plan accordingly. This is some of the staff members in our school. Uh, we decided that we would complete uh, the selfie questionnaire together. It meant that we had a collaborative approach, and if any of us were unsure of what a particular um, ter piece of terminology meant, we could discuss it together. It did not mean that we all put down the same answers, but rather we were learning together. We were completing it together. This is, these are the students, and we adopted the same approach with the students. We uh, had them completing the survey in small groups. We allowed them to ask questions of us. And again, these were clarifying questions where we were not telling them what we felt the preferred answers were. So in summary, Selfie is a practical tool that brings together perspectives of school leaders, teachers, and students. Yeah. It has a 360 degree approach and it focuses on six main areas. And you can see the six areas there, leadership, continuing professional development, assessment, infrastructure, teaching and learning. And in the context of what we're talking about today, student digital competence. These are some of the sample questions. 
that are asked in Selfie, and I'm just going to click all the way down to the student digital competence one. So one sample question is that students learn how to check that the information they find online is reliable and accurate. These are other sample questions. These questions relate to teacher digital competence, and I'll zoom them up. Uh, but that does, the formatting has been changed. But when you download the slides, you will see those. So I'm just going to skip past those because they're not readable, unfortunately. And there are sample questions on students' digital competence as well. So we could see what, what we as teachers felt about their competence, but the students had their own opinions. So I'm going to go straight to the results and the conclusions of assurance to teachers present uh, and to school leaders. There is a very good video guide for setting up Selfie. The more participants you have, the better uh, quality of information you get back for your report. We were able to do it in class time, as I mentioned already. Um, we could see what was working in the school, and we could see what we needed to work on. The student voice was hugely important because when we were discussing it as a staff asked afterwards, one of the questions that kept coming up time and time again was, what did the pupils think? And it really impressed on us the value of the student voice. It helped us to reflect on the use of technology in teaching, learning, and assessment, and we weren't concentrating on purchasing our devices or what we needed to do with the infrastructure of the school. We were able to have that conversation in a different time and in a different context. So the three areas that we focused on with regard to digital competence was we needed to be better at finding and selecting information ethically and responsibly. Students were too loose with just taking information and presenting it as their own. As a staff, we were good at creating digital content as teachers, but we weren't so open to students giving their evidence of learning to us through digital content, and that's one thing we wanted to prioritize. We looked at our standardized scores, our, st our test scores for standardized tests, as well as selfie findings, and we found that maybe we could improve in problem solving. So one action we took was to have computational thinking and problem solving in a continuum throughout the school. So the selfie report is confined to us. We didn't have to share it with anybody. We got certificates and badges for taking part. And you might say, well, what's, what's the advantage of that? But for children on the west coast of Ireland, it was a big thing. One of them said, imagine someone from Brussels sent this to me. It feels like they're part of a European-wide agenda and a European-wide collaborative project. We were able to submit our findings to a selfie forum, and there's a very good video. I've given you the link on the slides. You can check it afterwards. And again, the 220 people here, uh, you now have potential to introduce selfie in your countries. It's in many of your countries already, and maybe it's in the raising awareness part that you can raise further awareness. If you want to know more, there's a news page, there's a forum report, and there's a video. And I'll make all these slides available afterwards. The team are very open to um, communication, to improvements. They're a fantastic team. And uh, I'd urge you, and I would congratulate them on their work to date. And I'm just going to 
maybe take you on a quick two-minute journey as to what we did on one of our recommendations which related to problem solving and computational thinking. There's a fantastic report uh, produced by the uh, JRC on developing computational thinking in compulsory education. As a result, we were able to make our problem solving activities more practical through the use of digital tools, but they weren't the same ones throughout the school. We started with basic activities in junior classes. We introduced more complex tasks and complex instructions uh, as we worked our way up through the school. We had a variety of tools as well. So um, the first one you could see were B-Bots. These are Lego WeBot, uh, WeDo kits where we could bring in construction and more, think, uh, more advanced thinking on projects. Um, organization is hugely important as well and it brought some organizational pressures into the classroom. We didn't confine activities to the screen. We wanted to make sure that there was a link between what they were doing in paper and what they can do on screen as well. Uh, there was definite collaborative approaches and working together. And one area that I, we found excellent was the Bebris challenge for schools. This is a, a computational thinking challenge that has its origins in Estonia. We became part of that. It's, it's available to all schools in Ireland and it allowed us to focus on more complex tasks with the senior classes. Uh, now, in just past in uh, November is usually Bebris week uh, worldwide. Uh, we were challenged and again we got certificates for our participation and we felt it was a fantastic initiative to be part of. But such was the growing level of confidence on computational thinking, we organized a night for parents and neighboring schools to come and the children here prepared their posters of computational thinking questions that they introduced. It wasn't me, it was the children themselves. We also focused on, um, we had EU Code Week activities, so it, we were able to share our activities with other schools and other organizations. It has allowed us as well to prepare to become a digital school of distinction. This is an initiative in Ireland and one that is very worthy because it allows us to say confidently, we think we are a digital school and we want you to form accreditation for us. This is hoped to become a, a European-wide initiative. So there is uh, talks about a digital schools of Europe initiative. And that, again, is something that I think uh, would bring the whole digital competence agenda to the fore. So on that note, I'd just like to thank you for your participation. Uh, I will make all the slides available, and I'm happy to field any question um, from any of you. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, Excellent presentation, and also I have to agree what you said at the beginning, because now we have well over 200 participants in this webinar. So it's a really um, a good like number of multipliers, and also a really strong uh, message from the teacher and school community about their interest towards uh, digital competence in schools. So um, really excellent work uh, from both of you. So I really <laughs> encourage to keep it going and from the teachers to be so active. Uh, yeah, so any questions at the moment? Um, there were a few while you were speaking, so if I can just um, uh, take them now. Uh, sorry, it's so here. I'm just, <laughs> there's a lot of messages going on. So there was one question, I think, actually two questions, and I'm combining them into this uh, whole school approach. So one question is about um, in your on your school, like in your school, how the agreement for se uh, using selfie was agreed, what was the process? And the second uh, was how did you involve the families positively in this process? So it's more about uh, how did you involve the whole school and the parents? Okay. 
the parent uh, the uh, involvement of the parents uh, was in a um, a digital a digital night uh, that we hosted in the school and we invited parents to attend um, before planning at a whole school level to invest a lot of money and to ask for parental communication or um, parental um, cooperation you want to have whole school report, um, support so we invited them to the school uh, we outlined what we felt uh, we could offer and uh, we asked then uh, that they would support us um, I would say that we got unanimous support um, but they also I suppose they had come to us before that as I said because they felt that the future lies uh, with um, helping their students prepare for the next level of education and whether we like it or not a lot of their children are going to be working in jobs where uh, the advanced use of technology is going to be a critical component um, getting the agreement of teachers um, I suppose was easier really um, they were used to working with the framework I mentioned in Ireland looking at our school but they also wanted uh, a means uh, by which we could get the student voice and our awareness of selfie at that time we knew that we could get student opinion that could be contrasted and compared with our own opinion um, so that was an easy enough one to agree on uh, I just see a question there um, on did they have to sign a formal agreement um, in our case we didn't get the um, uh, parents to sign a formal agreement but we had it covered under an acceptable use policy so that selfie was included under the school's acceptable use policy I see some uh, questions about the slides and yeah just to remind everyone we will we will share the slides as well so you will have all the information there I just see I just um, see um, um, mention there of GDPR um, are the uh, general data protection regulations there isn't any personal private information shared through selfie and the school report is only available for the school it's not available uh, unless you choose to share it thereafter but there is no personal information of the students or indeed the teachers um, there is a question there about a school coordinator for developing digital competencies at each school in Ireland it's you can appoint one in secondary education if you have the finances and the student numbers but uh, most primary schools in Ireland do not have uh, a school coordinator uh, we don't have sufficient um, high enough uh, numbers of teachers or, 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 or students in each school in fact 70% of our schools are quite small uh, where the, the head teacher teaches as well as being the leader of the school um, there's another question about a school digital plan yes every school is expected to have a school digital plan and you create your plan uh, using uh, any of the frameworks that are involved it's not a pres prescribed template it's one that that you formulate at local level Thank you. And some other questions, either for Peter or Sean. Uh, there was a, another question earlier about the the price of the selfie. It's too. free, free to all schools. It is free yeah. to use. Yeah, all schools. And also, if you have any experiences, some um, some free activities that you can do with your students to um, increase the digital competences and skills, because that seems to be sometimes an issue that the school simply does not um 
well, I, I, I think the, I suppose the, the purchase of some of the resources that I showed there, the Lego and and um, the B bots, of course, they they require money, but the digital, the Bebras challenge is free. Uh, to all schools and they have a fantastic website of resources but there are you know a huge number of digital content sites that are freely available to um, teachers as well um, especially with the opening up of digital resources okay, we have time maybe um, one or two more questions so we'll Oh, we're a bit over time. So there's a one question from Marie Luisa. Um, where can uh, where can she find a good training course about digital competencies, included selfie instructions, either for Peter or Sean here? If you have any recommendations on other um, courses? Well, I certainly for the selfie. I think the selfie site itself have a fantastic bank of resources, including uh, video support. So once you once you uh, register as a coordinator. Um, there is a lot of support materials there. I don't think you need to look for a separate course. Um, the Selfie team have been very, very careful to provide uh, excellent training materials. Thank you. Any last questions? So, um, Haifa asks all schools in Europe and beyond, but I'm not sure. Um, the, um, do you mean the for the Selfie tool? I'm not sure if you can if, uh, you can uh, elaborate your question, but any final questions before we conclude this uh, webinar? Any questions for either speakers? Been some excellent comments throughout the webinar, so it's been very interesting. And Rayhan asks, is it uh, sustainable? I'm not sure in what um, sense sustainable. I suppose, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, I hope that it is. Um, I think that Europe and schools in Europe have been crying out for momentum. Uh, there have been a number of uh, digital champions, shall we call them, you know, teachers who are very advanced in their thinking and can see the huge possibilities for um, the use of digital tools and teaching, learning and assessment. And I think this is the type of momentum that is gathering now that will make projects like this sustainable. Uh, the more people and the multiplier effect always creates sustainability. Thank you very much. Um, there is uh, just one last question. I think it's quite interesting from Serenella. What are the basic digital resources in every classroom? Um, is um, is this an Ireland? Is well, I suppose all I can answer is that the basic digital resources are decided at local level. Um, there isn't anything given from central government. Uh, we receive a certain amount of funding and we, uh, in some cases we have to fundraise, we have to go to our school community and ask them to uh, raise money with us in order to purchase more materials or more tools and applications. Um, but we are allowed to make the decision at school level as to what teaching resources we need. So it was already six minutes um, past. So I suggest we close this webinar. Thank you very much for both uh, Peter and Sean for presenting. If you have any additional questions, either about the report or the selfie tool, you can contact our speakers. Uh, of course, we share all the material afterwards. And for further questions about the selfie tool specifically, you can uh, check out the website. It has a lot of informa information and resources. So really, thanks a lot for that. And uh, we, of course, shared the recording. And there was a question about the certificates. Yes, uh, they are available. Uh, what you need to do is you need to complete the feedback survey. There's a link here, and I will also put it into the chat. So once you complete it, you will have a link to download your certificates. But you need to be 
logged in on Teacher Academy, and you can use your eTwinning account to log in on, e on Teacher Academy as well. But you, after you complete the survey and you click done, you'll be able to download the certificate there. So it will be there for 24 hours. So I will just stop the recording here.